talk to you about all the improvements that went in and how those led to one year later, an event that didn't happen. So with that, let's uh, get into what the facility was. And um, I want to just move the slide. There we go. So 180 million cubic foot per day processing capacity. Wet gas in West Virginia, so we had a lot of liquids to process out of that gas. You can see several hundred thousand gallons per day of liquid. We had rail car loading, we had truck loading, and we had pipeline to get these liquids away from the site. This picture is to show you basically how old the facility was. It was built before PSM, so uh, they had to learn PSM after they already were operating the plant. But first, let's talk about who I am and uh, why you should care about hearing from me. I've, I've been in the industry for quite a while. I worked in power plants for the first part of my career, then in corporate risk management for electric and gas utilities. I uh, am now working for an insurance broker, and I help represent all of these uh, technical clients that we have to the London markets for insurance. I've been going over with uh, clients since actually I was a client when I worked in the utilities I was going over. And uh, it's exciting. It's fun to go over and explain technical risks. Um, as mentioned earlier, I do like to uh, use artificial intelligence to write the uh, web blog, energyriskengineeringinsights.com. And uh, if you have a topic or you have a question, shoot it to me and I'll be happy to help you use AI to get an answer. And then, as mentioned, I do like to caddy in these live tournaments. You guys are doing your rock, uh, walk challenge. When I walk around one of these uh, golf courses, it's about 17,000 steps and anywhere from eight and a half to 10 miles. If my golfer hits the ball straight, I walk less. If my golfer goes back and forth, then I walk 10 miles. So that's what I do. And that's who I am. Uh, what are we going to learn today? We're going to talk about red flags. Okay. You're going to see some, some things that are warnings that this explosion and fire were going to happen and pay attention to the red flags because that's, that's where the lessons learned will pop up. The other thing that we're going to do is look at the importance of audits and following up on the audit recommendations. You'll see that this facility was warned numerous times that what was about to happen or what we're going to see could happen. They knew they, they, they were ignoring the audit results that we're going to give them the, the warning. And then finally, we'll talk about how PSM works if we give it a chance. All right. So how did I get started in this company? Well, they had merged a power company with an oil and gas company. And I had come from an a electric and gas company. So I had some familiarity with LNG, cryogenic propane, with uh, rail car loading, with various hazards that would be involved in the, the gas processing. That wasn't the only uh, risk this company had. They had uh, 27,000 megawatts of power generation. They had, uh, the at the time, they were reactivating the largest LNG import terminal in the United States on the East Coast. Uh, a few years after it was activated, it, it only received a few ships before it was converted to an export terminal. Today, it, it may serve dual roles. Uh, I don't work there anymore, so I don't recall. But that was just one of the risks. Uh, another risk uh, was they had, if the United, the United States at the time had 3 trillion cubic feet of natural gas storage, our company managed one of those trillion cubic feet of storage. We owned half of the trillion cubic feet of gas that was in that storage, and we rented out the other half trillion cubic feet. So I had a lot of responsibility, had to look at a lot of risks. And uh, when it came around to this particular gas processing plant, I knew that PSM would get me quickly to the, to the issues that mattered. So I reached out to talk to the PSM coordinator. And when I got to the plant, she said that she didn't know anybody in corporate could spell PSM. Well, that's because they couldn't. Um, the, the fact is that, that it was a power company that bought a gas company. So their, their experience was through the power generation side. And in the power generation world, the, the chemicals that would trigger PSM 
would be chlorine for water treatment, ammonia for uh, your exhaust treatment for pollution. And it, it was always technically feasible for utilities to switch those processes and get away from PSM. Uh, some of them didn't, and there are some power companies that, that understand PSM. My natural gas background helped me in, in, in this situation. So I started to ask the uh, Miss PSM coordinator um, questions about her PHA recommendation action item tracking system. How does she keep track of the action items that were in the PHA? Or resulted from PHAs. And she quickly realized that I knew a lot about PSM. I had been trained in it. I was a certified auditor and something that I don't think she had even been trained in PSM yet. So she knew she had an uh, ally in corporate and I was there to help her. I wasn't going to be a corporate seagull. And if you recall, a corporate seagull is, is somebody who comes down from corporate, makes a lot of noise and then and craps all over the place and then goes home. Is there any voice in this, Mr. John? All righty. So the next thing that I found out was that this PSM coordinator worked directly for the plant manager. And the problem from my nuclear background, and, and I'd worked in nuclear power plants for, for several years before working for this company, I knew that the uh, quality assurance groups, the safety groups, the regulatory compliance groups, anybody that had oversight responsibilities, they couldn't really report through operations. When they reported through operations, there was a possibility that they're uh, going to have a conflict of interest. And we'll talk about the conflict that came about at this facility. And recall that PSM was just getting started. They didn't have a staff of PSM people. What they had was a PSM coordinator whose job was, her main job was basically the chemistry of the plant. Another problem that I found out was that everybody assumed that she was responsible for PSM. How many of you guys have had that same situation where people think that the PSM coordinator is responsible for everything to do with PSM? It was a problem in the early days and uh, another red flag. Keep paying attention to these red flags. All right. Now, this one was a bad one. The employees were warned by their representatives not to help the employer. Don't help the company write procedures to operate the equipment even if it would make it safer for somebody to operate that equipment, because they were told that if they helped write the procedures, anybody could run the equipment and their jobs would be in jeopardy. They were afraid to help, but that was just one of the kind of things that, that we were facing back then. I even tried to uh, inject a little bit of fire protection when I first got there. I said, guys, you handle a lot of hydrocarbons and there's plenty of ignition sources. We need to consider fire protection. And they immediately told me I didn't know what I was talking about, that you don't put a gas fire out and that you don't put water on gas fires. I know all that. I was trying to cool the steel. What I didn't want was a chain reaction. So... I've talked to the folks for a little while. Now I want to look at the paperwork and see just what were other people uncovering because uh, that, that's an easy place to, to start, right? There's someone else already did this review. They already looked at it, already made recommendations. Let me get a feel for the responsiveness to the recommendations. Are they following up on the recommendations or not? That was the first place I wanted to start. And I saw that right away they hadn't, taken into consideration their maximum uh, inventory of hydrocarbons. How can you do fire modeling when you don't know how many hydrocarbons you have? How can you do release scenarios when you don't know what your content of hydrocarbons are? That was a problem. This was also a problem. Another red flag. They were running this plant without knowing what the safe operating uh, lower limits, upper limits for their temperatures, flows, pressures. They didn't know them. They didn't know the consequences of deviation. Uh, it, it was a problem. And since it's Halloween, let's just say it was scary. <laughs> Some more scary things that, that were going on that, that uh, we uncovered during this, looking at other audits 
<laughs> the first audit, they didn't have written maintenance procedures. Okay. Uh, what they were doing was basically receiving a piece of equipment on a pallet with a manual tied to it. They untied the manual, put it in the filing cabinet, and now they thought that was their maintenance procedure. Well, 20 years later, we all know that maintenance procedures are, need to be specific to the process, not just generic to a valve or a pump or, or a motor. Uh, and again, excuse the uh, stock footage. The I don't know why stock footage actors and actresses don't wear safety glasses or hearing protection, but they don't. Another concern I had was that uh, they didn't keep track of the maintenance history. Now, I'm gonna take you into a little sidebar, why it's important to know about your maintenance history. For any of you folks who are engineers or tried to maintain equipment in the plant, think about a valve that leaks past the stem and the work order is written to go out and replace the packing or the work order says, stop the leak. Well, if you just go out and pull the gland follower, put in a new packing ring or two, put the gland follower back on, tighten it down, the leak will stop for a little while. The problem is it may come back in a month. And the next guy that comes along, he's possibly going to just put another couple packing rings on top again, because that worked last time for a little while. Well, where are the packing rings going? They're going down the body of the valve and out into the process. We don't want that. How do we stop that? When we go fix a, a valve, we look at the maintenance history, and if we see that it wasn't repacked properly last time, if it was just topped off, we want to shut the system down, pull the, the wiper rings out, pull all the packing rings out, pull the bottom wiper ring out if it's still there, put a new wiper ring in, put your new packing rings in and make sure that the seams on those packing rings don't line up, okay? If you're only putting a new one in every month or so, they may be lining up the seams and you might actually have a leak that you could have prevented. So we need a maintenance history. Training. Uh, this, this was another thing. I, I saw so many scary things. I kind of wonder how uh, the explosion held off until Halloween, actually. Uh, I was there two weeks before Halloween, so I barely missed the explosion, and I'm glad I did. Uh, but the training was amazing. So they had an emergency shutdown system, right? You, you, you pull one thing, the whole plant shuts down, all the gas gets sealed in, and it's safe, it's supposed to be safe. Every time there was a grid disturbance or a power outage, they would get an alarm on that system that told them it was out of service because it didn't have power. A modification was performed to add a universal, uh, uninterruptible power supply, a UPS, so a backup power supply so that when the ESD system lost power, it wouldn't go down. Well, the operators are running the plant, there's a brownout, and they know that they should get an alarm, they don't get the alarm. They don't get the alarm because it's got backup power, but they don't know that because they haven't been trained. So they think their ESD system is not working. They think the alarm system is not working, and really everything's working but they weren't trained. We don't know if they would have tried to use the ESD system if they thought it wasn't working. That was a problem there. Okay, we were looking for smoking guns. You wanna know what really led to this explosion and fire. I kind of pinned it on no written lockout tagout procedures. Um, we all know about putting plugs in drains so we don't have a single point of isolation now. This is one of the lessons that uh, led to that kind of, uh, a practice that we know to put in that plug. They didn't have a procedure to tell them to do it and it, and it wasn't done. Uh, our plant was so good that our plant manager actually had two smoking guns, yeah. Uh, believe it or not, he had three employees who were not trained to operate a cryogenic flammable process. They're out there running the plant. I think sometimes that I was lucky that uh, the explosion was two weeks later, scary. This was in the audit report, and you guys take a look at the words and tell me if they don't look like the plant manager told the PSM coordinator to write this statement. This is the first compliance audit, which has regarded the PSM program to be fully implemented. Huh? <laughs> I don't know about that. Let's look at the, the very next page of that audit said that the pre-startup safety review was not audited. No PSSR was conducted. How can you have a fully implemented PSM program that didn't look at PSSR? 
I think back in those days, what was happening was this PSM coordinator was being told what to write by the PS by the plant manager. All right, another red flag. Now, the the thing is, the folks that were were doing these audits, they weren't trained in uh, PSM or in auditing. Uh, it was a new concept. I fortunately had worked about eight years in a nuclear power plant before then learning about PSM. And uh, so it was a little bit more natural for me. I kind of knew what the ideas were and what we were, were looking for in audits. Um, so I got to go out and take a look myself. Well, I, I, some of the things I saw, I'm looking in a uh, 2003 audit and they weren't considering previous upgrades. In fact, I started looking and in PHA, there was so many things. We're not going to go through all these guys. I know that it's it's the end of your day. I don't want to bore you to tears, but what I want you to pay attention to is block alarms, block acknowledgement of an alarm. So what that means is that if there's an emergency or some event happening in your plant and the control room just lights up like a Christmas tree, you can push a button and all the alarms silence, all the noise goes off and you wait for the next alarm to come back in. Well, sometimes you get level switches, you get pumps that start intermittently and the alarm that it's not running may not just come right back in if you're not trying to run it. So this block acknowledgement can erase very important information. And if we still have that sort of uh, configuration, we need to work away from it. We need to work at uh, making sure that the operators have a coordinated uh, prioritization of their alarms because it's important that uh, they can focus on what matters and that uh, they're really not trying to take on the whole role of the engineer, the designer, and everybody in figuring out what's the priority of these alarms. I keep saying it's scary, right? Uh, this this just is amazing. So um, the PSSR for the uh, cryogenic upgrade, this plant was in the middle of a large cryogenic retrofit. And um, it wasn't finished. The training wasn't done. The operating procedures weren't revised. And the PHA recommendations weren't addressed. The PSM coordinator told the plant manager that, and he said, sign the PSSR or you're fired. So she signed it and away they went. And now I'm there after the fire asking her, you know, why did you sign this document? You know, it's, it's there in writing. And she said, well, my boss told me if I didn't sign it, I'd be fired. I said, well, if anybody had been killed or injured, you, you know, could be looking at some serious penalties here. So everybody, if you're ever being asked to um, sign a document that's false, uh, be careful about that because uh, the, uh, the consequences, you know, are going to be out of your hands when that happens. They were not responding to audit findings. Okay. Now think about that. The, they have a previous audit. They've got all the findings. Well, they're not responding to them so I make that another finding. I, I want to drill down on that one because you can kind of tell people that they've got uh, termites or how do we say, namo al ard. Okay, <laughs> hopefully I got that right and didn't butcher it too bad. Uh, but if they have the termites and their house is still standing, they might ignore you. But eventually their house is going to fall. And, and your job is to not be there when it falls. <laughs> but if they don't want to listen to the advice, then you, you really have done all you can in the, in the audit process. There's going to be some other ways you might be able to, to escalate. Okay. So a lesson learned there is don't ignore me. All right. So I've looked at internal audits. I've done an audit myself from corporate. Now somebody from the outside wanted to come see this plant. An engineer from a very large insurance company, global insurance company that wanted to uh, come out and look at the plant. They were insuring this plant and they wanted to see it. Well, uh, I can tell you that it didn't go well at all. I knew it wasn't going to go well. And this, this gentleman came out and walked around for a little while. We went back in and we started talking to the plant manager. And one of the things that he said to the plant manager was, your PSM program sucks. He said that straight out. He said, if my underwriter knew how bad this risk were, we wouldn't be on it. Okay. That 
was bad. I had to sit there and take it. I knew that our PSM program sucked. And I knew that, you know, we needed to fix things. And, I, and I'd already pointed some of those things out. And I'd already tried to get more fire protection in there. And, uh, you know, during the walk around, we saw <laughs> an employee laying under a fin fan cooler sleeping, just taking a break in the process area. Nobody stopped him. Nobody went over there to see if he was okay. And then we go inside and we have the exit conference with the plant manager and the engineer. That was how that audit went. So two weeks later, this is what we were uh, basically waiting for. All right. So we, uh, we had an explosion and the explosion turned into a fire. The fire you see on the left is stock footage. I wasn't there when it happened. I was there the next day. It was still smoldering. You can see the photo on the right. That's the absorber tower that was destroyed. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. But at 1215 is when this explosion was recorded to happen. Everybody went to lunch at about 12. So they weren't out in the process when it happened. That was very, very fortunate. All right. This is what the absorber skid looked like after the fire. Uh, very intense heat local in this one area. Um, there was some light heat in other areas. We'll talk about that. During the fire, because it was a small community, local families, just the, the school principal from the, the local elementary school called the control room, talked to the plant manager, asked them if it was okay. They'd heard the explosion. They saw the smoke and they were nervous. He said, do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Okay. Do whatever makes you feel comfortable. Is that the right thing to tell the public when your plant's on fire? I don't think so. Uh, we needed a organization. We needed an emergency response plan. So goodbye, Mr. Plant Manager. He wasn't going to get too many more opportunities to kill anybody. All right. When the firefighters were there, they reported hearing a hissing sound. Now, if you look up at a process and you hear a hiss and someone says, where was it? It's going to be hard to pinpoint it and nail it down. But we did, we did get the information that there was a release that they heard ongoing when they got there. All right. So during the investigation, we found out that there could have been multiple sources of the leak. We found multiple sources that any one of them could have been the leak. Look again at this, this tower. Uh, what happens is things like uh, the, the valve packing burns out, small sight gauges break, and the board on tube breaks, and, and you have a release. Big sight glasses on large towers can break, and that's what we ended up have happening. So if you're trying to find out how big the leak was, and you're, this isn't our facility, but it, it's large, and you guys might be involved in facilities like this, I, I, I think what we need to do is figure out what we're looking for when we get into this. So we're going to look, we're going to first try and figure out how big of a leak was it. The, the leak formed a vapor cloud. And I'm going to take a sidebar right here because Devendra asked me to talk about LNG. Now this facility did not process LNG. It didn't make LNG and it didn't in any way handle LNG, but it had liquid propane, liquefied petroleum gas, liquid natural gasoline. We're going to talk about LNG real quick. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of an LNG vapor cloud fire so that you can see for yourselves how LNG reacts when it burns outside in the environment. Uh, a lot of people think that LNG will explode. I'm going to show you the video. It does not explode. You have to be careful when you're looking at vapor clouds, because if the vapor cloud has a mix of methane, which is buoyant and say 20 percent propane, which is not, the methane can boil away and leave that propane behind. And now you have an explosive cloud. So, so, so be careful when I say that an LNG cloud won't explode. That's what I mean. It depends on the on the heavy fragment. Well, uh, take a look and just watch this slow flame front and realize you can walk faster than this flame front. After the video, I'll, sh I'll talk to you about uh, some special information you need to respond to LNG spills, large ones, and then uh, we'll continue back on this loss. Take a look. The video is not sped up. 
It's not slowed down. That's how fast an LNG flame front burns in an LNG vapor cloud. Okay. Now, one of the things you notice is that that flame is orange. Okay. It's orange. It's rich. All right. It, it, there's not enough air in that, even though it's outside, there's not enough air. When you have a vapor cloud of LNG, in order for it to absorb enough air to become explosive, it also absorbs the heat in that air, which makes it buoyant. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things that that buoyancy can do and how it can help us. Again, I say, depending on the heavy fraction, it won't explode. It'll just be a flash fire. Now, if you want to control that, that spill, say before there's a fire, if you apply high expansion foam onto a pool of LNG, the ground level vapor cloud will be cut in half because what's gonna happen is you're gonna increase the boil off rate, but you're gonna also warm that vapor and that's a buoyant vapor. So it's gonna go up. So you've cut the vapor cloud in half of the ground-based vapor cloud when you use high expansion foam on liquefied natural gas. If it's LP, if it's heavier than air, when it vaporizes, you have to be careful because when you put high expansion foam on it, you increase the boil off rate. And what does that do? That doubles the length of that ground-based vapor cloud, just the opposite of what we want to accomplish. So understand that about LP versus LN, geez, all righty. And then and of course you can walk faster. So those are the, the highlights of working with LNG. Now let's go back to West Virginia. In West Virginia, remember, they didn't use LNG, but they had a vapor cloud that was heavier than air, and we needed to figure out how much fuel was in that vapor cloud. This is the actual drawing that we had 20 years ago. It's so cool that uh, Mark Boone, my buddy engineer who was with me that day, he helped me out with this and got this. So looking at the burned area, when we walked into the process, I showed you that picture of the absorber skid and the other equipment around it that had burned, that it was black, it was scorched. We knew that there was a high intense fire there. Then look at the other bubble and you see it just says melted. And what we're seeing there is anywhere in the process where we saw, say, instrument tags just barely melted, or we saw uh, plastic that was twisted or deformed, just some evidence that there was some heat there temporarily. We felt like that identified to us where the vapor cloud boundary was because the fuel burned up, it, it caused some slight heat uh, damage, and then it was gone and nothing else was exposed to burn. So that gave us an idea of the size of the vapor cloud. Well, once you know the size of a cloud, there's actually formulas that tell you uh, a release of this many gallons will make a cloud that big. So we did the back calculation. We took the gap procedure, ran it backwards and figured out after all the, the math and all the, the uh, thinking and everything that we were trying to figure out that it was going to be a small leak, all right? A small leak that was going to look like this. Something that, you know, was, was a packing out of a valve or something small. We weren't looking for a broken pipe. And that's, that, that was very helpful. This kind of tied into what the fire department said that they'd heard the hiss. Okay. Talking to the fire department and talking to the plant people, doing the interviews, what we found out was that the um, valve that was hissing, they could hear this valve hissing and they had to go close it the rest of the way at the end of the fire. We found out that the operators the day before were conducting a lockout tag out without a written procedure. And they, when they closed this drain valve in that absorber area, they closed it on a piece of ice. Well, the nighttime goes and the ice doesn't melt because it's cool. And then the next morning, the sun comes up and about noon, the ice melts that comes out of the plug. There was no plug. So the, the, the hydrocarbons started coming out and forming this vapor cloud, presumably around noon. And uh, then the uh, natural gasoline that uh, came out of, of this vapor cloud or out of this small leak was no way going to be, you know, the 4,000 gallons that actually burned. So we had to figure out what was this hiss, what was that valve, and, you know, what was going on in that area. We saw this spot below, okay? Imagine steel grating 
And if there's a fire first, all that steel grating gets cooked, it turns black and it's charred. That's not what we saw. We saw all of it charred except for a small circle, just a nice little circle, the size of the outlet of that valve. So we figured that the liquid was flowing through that valve onto that steel grating first because the zinc was still there. If the fire happened first, the zinc and the galvanization would have been burned off. And no matter how much cold liquid you put on it, it's not going to come back. So we were very certain that we found the initial source of fuel. Now it's time to figure out the um, ignition source because we had this chain reaction going through the plant. And, you know, we, we started with a small leak. We broke that sight glass and we added that 4,000 gallons of natural gasoline. Okay. It was it was a big fire. It was intense, and uh, the you know the the accounts were varied. Let me say this: when you have a vapor cloud that engulfs a process area, and you've got junction boxes, electrical junction boxes that are in that cloud, if they are not sealed, and the vapor cloud basically infiltrates those boxes. If the cloud lights off, as the flame front comes through that cloud, it's going to light the gas in each of those boxes. So we had panel doors blowing off all over the plant. Some people said they heard seven explosions. And that was these doors popping off. Uh, the flame front of this fire was fast. It wasn't LNG. It wasn't slow. It was very quick. So some people heard multiple explosions. Some heard just one long explosion. So that's what you're going to get when you get eyewitness accounts. Okay. Uh, the drain valve didn't do it. It was the nearby vessel. Now, we had to figure out the ignition source. And we were with an engineer that told us that uh, he went out with the fire marshal the day before. Okay, there was a, a switchgear building that was due to be moved out of the process. Because of some hurricanes, the local utility wasn't available to help disconnect it and help us move it. But the PSSR was signed off that it was ready to go. So it's in the middle of the process. And uh, there was a door laying next to it and the walls were puffed out the uh switchgear building kind of looked like this this isn't the switchgear building but i just wanted to remind everybody who's seen switchgear buildings before what a switchgear building looked like our local fire department fire marshal comes out to investigate the fire now all he looks at is house fires and car fires so he was a little over his head here in a, a cryogenic gas processing plant he told our plant engineer and plant manager that that switchgear building was not the ignition source for this explosion. He said that what happened was the fireball from the vapor cloud burning consumed the oxygen in the air so fast that it created a vacuum and that vacuum sucked open the door of that building. Hmm. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. So the next day I go out and I see the green door still laying on the ground and there's a gray stripe of paint on that green door. And I'm thinking, where'd that come from? And I see there's a little square gray panel next to this green door. And I, ah, that's where it came from. Where'd that gray door come from? I turned around and looked inside the, uh, let me get my slide. I turned around and looked inside the switchgear building. And this is what it looks like, a bunch of great doors. And one of them was not on its cubicle. It was actually out there on the ground with us and it hit it. It had hit the green door, knocked it off. So even though the fire marshal said this building couldn't have done it, we now knew this building was the source of the ignition. And uh, knowing the source of the ignition, knowing the source of fuel, we can proceed to rebuild the plant. And uh, now we're going to go prevent recurrence. It's time to uh, rise like the phoenix from our ashes and uh, figure out how to make the plant not have this happen again. Uh, we added so much 
uh, loss control, fire protection, risk management to this plant, but it's more than equipment. Uh, but there was a lot of equipment. There were 41 new deluge systems or 41 new fire protection systems added. Uh, we added uh, security cameras. Oh, we did an offsite vapor cloud analysis. The plant manager got replaced. Yes, that was good news. Goodbye, Mr. Plant Manager. Um, we moved PSM. PSM had to report outside of plant operations. Plant PSM went all the way to corporate so that we'd have an idea of what was going on at the plant. And we started doing insurance company recommendations. So within five days, my engineer Mark and I had put together this list. This is uh, several pages of all the systems that we added to the facility. Now, as we were developing this list, tell you a quick story. It was interesting. A vice president of operations who I'd never seen before came out, wanted to know what we were doing, who we were. We told him and he said, well, how much is it going to cost? And we said, one week's revenue would have stopped this whole thing in its tracks. He didn't understand at the time, but he knew what one week's revenue meant compared to a six month shutdown because of this fire. So he was into it. He said, give me a list. And that's what this is. We gave him the list so that we could get some money, $3 million 20 years ago to put in the Mark Boone valve house. Uh, that's not all we did with the, with the money, but uh, extremely proud of it and uh, happy that, that, you know, we can give Mark credit, give you the full picture there, the Mark Boone valve house. Now, let me tell you what happened. One year later, we've, we've learned some lessons from this event and something else is about to happen. Remember, they were running the new cryogenic plant. They were demolishing some of the old antique equipment with cutting torches and grinding wheels. During this process, there was a need to blow down a boiler in the operational area. The boiler was blown down to the, the drains, the plant drains, which through years of leaks had accumulated hydrocarbons. So when that hot water hit that drain, another, hot, another uh, vapor cloud formed in the plant. The fire watch saw the vapor cloud heading towards his welder, towards the guy cutting and grinding, grabs him by the shoulder and they take off running. The welder drops the torch. They turn around in time to see the vapor cloud come across the fireball. Or the vapor cloud come across that torch. And uh, yeah, that's what we got. Uh, a reminder of last year, but the neat thing was this time <laughs> they had a sprinkler system there. It operated and it was a deluge system. Uh, not this one. You guys can see that this is a regular closed head, but uh, they had a deluge system operate and it knocked this fire down to nothing that uh, would endanger the plant. So PSM will work when it's allowed to. And uh, I think with that, I am ready to take questions. I will uh, hopefully see if, if I can hear you guys. And if I can't, I have a question for you real quick. How many red flags were there? Uh, let's open it up and uh, see if we're hearing it. Hopefully. Well, I'm not hearing anybody. I hope you guys didn't just uh, sit there and see a blank screen for the last 40 minutes. I see a hand up uh, and I see some muted folks. I think the, the fellow that's got his hand up is muted. Do I need to unmute you? Yeah, Mr. Venkata Surya Prakash has raised their hand. Well, are there any questions? Yeah, good, good evening. I, I have one question to you because the topic is about cryogenic uh, systems. So when we use propane in hydrogen process, for example, because uh, Middle East is gearing up for shifting over to hydrogen now. Uh, uh, so if propane is used for the chilling purpose, so what additional precautions as a cryogenic liquid it will pose on hydrogen systems? Hydrogen systems. Because hydrogen... hydrogen... 
you tailed off at the end there. Uh, I think the question has to do with using propane as a refrigerant in a cryogenic process involving hydrogen. That was the premise. Was What was yes. the question yes. about that? So are there any other... No, so now what are the additional, what are the additional risks that uh, the hydrogen production, uh, chilling instead of cooling, cooling, instead of using water for cooling, if we use propane, which requires in a large quantities. So what additional precautions were required? Because right. it is, it, even though it is considered as utility. You need to, when you start dealing with cryogenics, one of the big issues is the uh, structural stability of any steel that it hits. If it leaks out and hits steel, we had we had an LNG tank in downtown Baltimore. There was a two inch relief valve that opened and sprayed LNG on the outside of that tank. That cryogenic temperature cracked the tank. So it wasn't a fire, it wasn't an explosion. It was just the cryogenic hazard that we had to deal with. I, I, we're becoming aware of hydrogen and conversions from natural gas burning combustion turbines over to hydrogen. And I know that there's a problem with the, 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 just the hydrogen leaking out of the seals, leaking out of the equipment, that basically the fuel supply, uh, whenever you quit switch over from natural gas to hydrogen, uh, causes issues. Actually, using propane as a refrigerant has been done for years. I remember, in, in fact, in that same LNG plant that we had, they had the, the spray of LNG on the side of the tank. It used what we called MRL, mixed refrigerant liquids, which was propane based. So it's going to introduce, if people think that the hazard with hydrogen is, is not there because it's lighter than air. And then if you're involving propane, you guys know that now you're adding this lower or this heavier than air product so you have you add just a whole new set of hazards again it's all the typical ones you would have with propane watch your ignition sources the low low points where would it go um hopefully that answers the question do we have any more yeah yes. myself myself deepak dubey from kefco i have one question if you are uh, in your presentation you said a small leak and if a small leak, uh, how much ignition source energy is required for fire? Oh, what's the minimum ignition source uh, for the fire? That's a tough one. Uh, let me put it this way. We, we, in the power gen world, we work with coal dust, and it's very difficult to get coal dust to ignite, but it, it, we can. In this case, uh, the the it was a forty one sixty volt breaker. It was a plant breaker that you know failed. It may have been less than that four eighty volt breaker that that failed. But knowing the actual minimum ignition temperature to ignite it, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Depends on uh, different different material and different different material uh, required to different different ignition source. Now, second question uh, one of our present uh, like earlier which kind of fire protection or which kind of protection we will use for cryogenic material as you said if cryogenic material leak uh, in the plant then uh, in your the list you didn't mention passive fire protection because if hydrogen or other cryogenic material there is a freezing point then it's still embrittlement may happen because currently in i am in ammonia 7 project blue ammonia project and that kind of uh, uh, problem we are facing if you are not considering passive fire protection spr cell dp and api then what will happen okay yeah it, it, it's tough to uh, manage all of the hazards at the same time isn't it uh, I do know that you can't put low expansion foam on either one of them because they're you really just add heat to the spill. So when when we're talking about what kind of protection, we need to think about what it is that why we need to protect it. We have to be careful about just wanting to put out all fires versus wanting to keep all the equipment safe. And that's kind of where 
my original uh, dis- d- disconnect was with the plant people. They they did not see that all I wanted to do was spray water on the steel. I wasn't trying to put out the fire. And same with a cryogenic fire. You have to be careful because you might actually make it worse with uh, virtually any agent that you put on. Now, if you put high expansion foam on a pool of uh, cryogenic fuel and it's not burning, you're going to freeze a bottom layer of that high expansion foam and that will slow down some of the vaporization rate. If it's already on fire and you put high expansion foam on it, you're creating an insulation from the radiant heat so that it doesn't boil off more vapor. So you're slowing down the vaporization. But in each case, you know, you really need to ask, do we want to put it out? What no, John, are the concepts? John, 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 my question, based on cryogenic material, you said what kind of protection before any active fire protection? You, you are explaining to me after fire. I am saying before fire, as you said, fire detection right that is a pa- that is a passive and uh, fire proofing that is the passive if fire happened so first line of action not a active first line of action always fire gauge detection you will not start the foam system or fire water because foam for cryogenic area depends on uh, that MSDS and if tank form area or pool fire case, you will not direct impingement of fire water because fire water you uh, only for cooling purpose, reduce the thermal radiation impact to nearby structure or equipment, right? And and phone uh, system. Sorry to, sorry to st- interrupt, Mr. Deepak. Uh, point on the questions only as per the presentations and we have more uh, people also to ask the questions so be on point okay, no fine so because in your presentation uh, you are no more argument on which kind of yes. fire protection you require and we put in deluge systems oh, we, okay, this is what we use deluge system, deluge system that is the huh? second line of action like not the first the line of action no, no, no. Undal ne na jin bhar tal le no kya le. Pratidhan ki. There is a second line of action. Agreed. I think the first line of defense was to train the, the, the employees on how to handle their materials. Uh, we want to keep the the bad stuff in the process. I agree with that. I think I'm not understanding what the concern is. Uh, you know we're. We're, we're looking at trying to put out or, or trying to, to protect the property and uh, prevent a chain reaction or domino effect through the plant. So uh, I think, like I sa- I've said before, that, that codes and standards help us with some of those initiators before the event. They help us do the things that are supposed to work, like having a fire watch, having written procedures. But when people don't follow the codes and standards and when they don't implement the recommendations from the audit reports, well, then then you have to be creative and think outside the box. And how can we protect them from themselves? And and what we did at this plant was we we knew that we we could get another vapor cloud. And so uh, and that there could be a potential for a, a pool of cryogenic material on fire. We don't really know how we're going to put that fire out with a system. But we do, and we also know that the fire department's not going to do it, and they might get hurt trying. But we can keep the rest of the plant cool. So uh, trying to prevent the fire, I think, is 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 the the things that you you and I do all the time. I don't know if there's a a really good system concept for just a generic cryogenic flammable fire. Uh, you know, it, it, we could look at the specifics of the cryo and specifics of, you know, what the flammables are, but it's kind of tough to, to, to design a system for uh, potentials when, when we haven't defined what the, the variables are. Yeah, uh, Mr. John, thank you. Uh, there are some few questions in the chat box. So Mr. Ramna or Mr. Devendra can uh, share that questions. 
John, we have a next question posted by uh, Mr. Harshad Kumar. Uh, is there any organization doing competency assessment for uh, PSM coordinators before placing them on job? And what are the elements to be considered for competency assessment? Are there any automations, did you say? No. Is there any organization doing competency assessment of PSM coordinators before placing them on job? Oh, competency of PSM coordinators before placing them on the job. Right. I'm sure in 20 years that uh, since this poor lady was uh, just basically given the responsibility that uh, there's more training available for PSM coordinators. I know that I went to ABS. I learned PSM. I learned how to audit. This was all available back then, you know, 20 years ago. So I, I'm, I'm sure it's still there. I'm sure we've learned lessons. PSM has, has come a long way. Uh, it's great that it's a uh, it's not prescriptive that we can that it basically just says, don't kill anybody, do whatever it takes not to kill anybody. So we're trying to do whatever it takes not to kill anybody. <laughs> OK, OK. So uh, another question is there uh, by yeah, Mr. Abu from uh, what's the correct time for to conduct the PSSR workshop and audits? It could uh, be. Before Decommissioning or after it? PSSR. What is the correct time to perform the PSSR? Well, after everything on the PSSR is finished, right? You, you, when, when you say that the, the drawings have been revised, as-built notices can survive. I mean, you, you can use an as-built notice if everybody that pulls a drawing knows that there's an as-built attached to it. If you don't have that system, you need to have the actual drawing, the live drawing that everybody can download to be updated. So the, you know, in, in this case that happened 20 years ago, it, it, it involved, they didn't have procedures. They didn't have training, it, you know, the, all the failures that uh, led to why we have learned all these lessons in the past 20 years. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, yeah. The action taken by FNG should minimize the impact. Okay. No, no. This is nothing else. Um, anybody want to raise any question? Okay. I think uh, there is no more questions. So, Mr. Ramanaji, we can go ahead with our uh, next uh, this one. Yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you, Mr. Jan. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, some uh, little disturbance from me. I apologize for that, actually. I thought that uh, my mic, your mic was on mute condition, but it was not. Sorry for that. And now I'm going to post uh, the quiz. Uh, sorry, before posting, I have made uh, the poll. The poll. The uh, I'm going to run the poll now, which consists 10 questions. You can see the answers on the screen itself. Uh, whoever answers the uh, correct, like who select the uh, maximum people who select the uh, one choice, it will be shown in the bar graph. Maybe you can think that is a correct answer, or you can think your own answer. and answer this one in the upcoming uh, quiz, not in this. Poll will be like it's open for all, but the dedicated link will come to you in the chat box, which you need to click on that and answer the questions to get your participation certificate that's mandatory, okay? And uh, the quickest uh, answer person will be announced uh, as a winner in the upcoming slides. Uh, that's why just go through, it will take, you can take time yeah, in this poll, but not in the quiz, okay? So just go to the polls now, I'm going to launch it. Okay, poll is launched. You can answer these questions. Uh, I'll give two minutes. 10 questions are there, okay. Three minutes.
there are 10 questions in the poll. Hey, stop. Why? Oh, my God. Something happened. Yeah, it's not respond responding, Ramanaji. I don't know. Someone might have stopped, I think. Okay. Let me... Uh, it's not working, I think. No, it okay. I'm relaunching it again. Okay. I'm relaunching it. Yeah, from now, three minutes. There was some issue, actually. Poll is launched. If you are on mobile, just move your screen, minimize your screen so that you will get this poll. If you are not getting the poll, then it is uh, error from your side. Poll is on now. Poll is running, it's not stopped. Maybe it's from your device. Poll is on. Oh, again stopped. I don't know really. There is some issue, I think. Okay, you might have gone through the questions, no? When I relaunch the poll, it will be easy for you to answer the questions, okay? So I will reduce it to two minutes now. I'm relaunching it. And maybe I don't know if I uh, so move Ramnaji, the screen. Actually, while, while giving the answer, there is an issue. It's not working. No, no, it will work. It will work. See, I relaunched it because I am I'm just moving the screen to other uh, uh, area. That's why it is ending. So I'm not touching it all now. I'm just calculating it now. For, you know, I'll count on it to two minutes. We'll see. Oh, oh. There is. Ramanaji, oh. problem is there. Uh, let us move uh, to the next part of the uh, session. Uh, yeah, there is some problem, I think. I don't know. Uh, four of 45 only answered, but I don't know what is the problem. Okay, in this case, I have to do something. I have given, I missed it actually. I have given co host permission to few of the people, so there is an issue. I should have removed all uh, those permissions. Anyway, I'm going to post this link in the chat box. Just click on that and uh, you can answer. It will be only five questions. In the poll, it, uh, I have added 10 questions, but in the feedback form, there will be only five questions. Okay, link is posted in the chat box. Just click on that and answer the questions. After the questions, you will have a, a feedback on the event. After completing the submission, your data will be noted and the same data will be taken to issue the certificate, okay? So those who have participated, you, you know, those who are going to participate, in the quiz only will receive the participation certificate. Please note. I'll post the link again. It's the same link. Yeah. 
there are only five piece questions added in this. Okay, take your time because uh, questions are a little bit lengthy, but answers are very simple. Okay, just these are like, you know, tricky questions, it looks like. But if you were on the presentation, it is very easy to answer. Very good, nice results I'm getting. Uh, Ramanaji, you can share your screen, huh? your presentation. It's all blank. Presentation? Yeah, so please, please screen. No? Your slide, is, everything is empty now. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm not sharing any slide. It is an, uh, no. I'm saying uh, uh, display, display something. Gallery mode. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Actually, I need to take the winner's list. That's why. No problem. People can see the other uh, participants, no? Let them be. Because networking will be there. You can you know, talk to the other people when the time permits. Uh, okay, so the next session will be recognizes uh, oh, sorry, felicitation will be there. Just give me 10 seconds. I'm going to note on the winners. Time being, uh, they can ask if any questions, anything, feedback. Very good. Okay, now the winners are noted. We are going to announce it uh, during the presentation during the felicitation now uh, it's time to fill time for felicitation i'll just run the slides now uh, our uh, secretary will be taking care of felicitation uh yusuji are you there uh Abul Afamji, are you going to take the felicitation session? Or you want me to continue? Yeah, yeah do it, Mr. Ramana, do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, okay. We'll start with the felicitation. Now, as a token of appreciation, we are uh, giving a token of appreciation to our uh, presenter, Mr. Jian. Jan, thank you for your presentation. 
it was wonderful and uh, if we are receiving any more questions will be posted to you to get the answers thank you very much and thank you guys of... enjoyed it thank you thank you and as a token of appreciation we are going to send this send this certificate to you and now we are going to announce the poll winners it's not poll winners actually quiz winners you can say hasan ibrahim the first winner hasan ibrahim kargay thank you very much mr hasan the second winner is faizal pari thank you mr faizal third winner is ali al hamoud is it dr ali al hamoud hamoud i just want to know that's it and uh, now i request our uh, vice president to give a closing remarks and then later we'll go for the networking and the new members can get chance to introduce themselves during the networking uh, session okay we'll have 5 to 10 minutes networking yeah our Hello. vice president mr abule farm yes. will be yeah, thank you, you mr ramna you thank you mr ramna uh, for your support and organizing this sessions wonderful and thank you mr devendra deputy committee of the esm committee and mr arshad ayub for organizing such type of uh, our psm session on monthly basis uh, we are we are glad to uh, thanks to say mr john who is here and who supported us as a speaker and we have received many wonderful informations and we are thankful to our ssp members and other professionals who joined these sessions so once again thanks a lot on behalf of ssp co chapter and we have another uh, uh, moment that where we can join and to familiar to each other so after that mr devendra and mr ramna will uh, say and ask you something and you can raise your voice and you can uh, further will know about the ssp co chapter so it will be a coordination session thank you baba thank you thank you dear uh, vice president now the stage is open for the networking okay those who would like to talk you can uh, the mic is open for all now okay if anybody anybody would like to talk you can directly talk there is no restrictions now yeah we request uh, the new participants who are first time joining this session ss which a quick chapter session so if you can introduce themselves uh, their name where they are working and the country they belong yeah new members we had call assalam alaikum uh, good evening all good evening good evening Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, this is Saud Al Anizi from Saudi Arabia. I'm working for a Japanese company in Saudi Arabia called Thank You. I am the QHC manager with the company, and really thank you so much for this great session. Uh, we got a lot of use, uh, useful information, and really it is highly appreciated. Thank you so much all for the organizer, speaker, all everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saud, for having you here. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Harsh Kumar Patel. I'm, I'm uh, first time joining the meeting. I'm uh, from uh, KNPC Mina Abdul Ali Refinery, Operation Engineer. And thanks, Devendra, for inviting me to join. It's wonderful session and uh, really a lot of insightful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh Ji, for joining. Uh, good Hello, evening. Sir. Assalamu alaikum. Selfie is Harsh Dulhuda. I joined first time this meeting. I think it is good session. 
uh, what is the criteria to award winning session who the time factor or answer for 5 to 5 points ramna ji yeah uh, what is the time this is answers questions sessions it is time factor who answer the all questions within time factor yeah 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 i'm sorry actually yeah it is time factor those who answers in quicker time those okay. will be shown quicker time the first correct answers okay. persons actually i did also fall okay. five to five answer yeah 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 there are so many but quicker okay. quick pace quickest answer okay 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 thanks thank you